Hello and welcome to another Olo Life episode. We are exploring different target curves while it's part of the research and development process. And in this episode, we'll dive into capturing a target curve coming up. What is a target curve? Well, in short, uh, it's a frequency response or SPL levels that a certain playback device should achieve in order to be or to sound in a specific way. Um, so, for example, we have multiple target curves. One of the most talked about uh, target curves in schools, for example, is the Fletcher and Manson target curve which is basically how we hear. The evolution of that uh, target curve is the ISO 226, which is the equal loudness contours, as, as they call it. Um, and we also have uh, the Harman target curve, for example, which is also very popular and, and uh, well known. What do you want to do first? Uh, let's put this uh, Genelec monitor on our... Right, so, okay. So, Gregor, when you were doing research online, and I know we've talked to a lot of people, including uh, people from Grass, yeah. um, is there uh, any specific way for capturing uh, room responses? Well, firstly, we, we want to put our speaker on the same length from left and right uh, wall. Right. Okay, so we need a tape measure? Yeah. All right, I'll go and find one. It's over here. <laughs> Got it. <clears throat> okay. So this is uh, interesting, right? So the, the last time uh, when I was uh, in this room, Gregor was also measuring something and the mic was pointing towards the, the speaker. So maybe you can share a little bit. Is the position of the mic important when you're doing yeah, basically with this we are measuring the room, mm. uh, the posi position of the, the height of the speaker should be on your listening position, mm -hmm. so it needs to be a little bit higher, so the speaker too. Mm -hmm. If we are standing, presumably we are standing. Yes, yeah. Yeah. but if we put it towards it, mm. we measure basically the speaker. Direct yeah. response. Yeah. And the room and the room a little bit yeah. so you should measure wherever you will yeah. listen yeah. that's the place where you want to measure the room no matter where the source actually is yes exactly. that's kind of the idea all right yeah. so if i'm not mistaken that is just for calibration now we have a calibration which means that the pink noise being uh, played back yeah. is now calibrated and now we need to capture it. So if we capture it with a microphone like this, uh, that is for room calibration and room targets, but headphones work in a different way. So you have little enclosure on your ears, uh, very little space, little air in there. Uh, also headphones rely uh, a lot on, on the closing um, so that the air cannot escape. That's why if you have um, really poor ear pads or if you're wearing glasses, for example, and you have air leakage between the glasses and your ear pads, the bass will drop. So in order for headphones to show you the bass, to actually hear it, they need to see it quite, quite well. Um, and that makes it impossible to use this kind of microphones uh, for measuring headphones. Um, this is why the telco companies in the 70s and then 80s uh, developed uh, a lot of different standards. So one of those is over here. This is one of the early standards, which is the, um, it's from Grass 45cc, but that is um, the 318-1 free, free yeah, yeah. uh, standard, I think. Uh, and we will also do measurements with the 711 standard, which is the full pinna. So this is the actual artificial ear, a simplified version. The good thing about this is that it's very accurate uh, and that means that you can repeat all the measurements with high accuracy, but it does not have all the details 
uh, does not show you all the details, for example, like with the 711 coupler, which is IEC 318-4. Um, the difference, the main difference is that this one is simulating how the sound comes to your ear on the outside before it enters your ear canal. The other one, the 711 coupler, is designed to mimic um, the ear or the sound that comes to your eardrum. So there are two different positions. One is outside, right? Just before it enters your ear. Um, and the other one is at the end when the sound actually travels through the ear canal uh, all the way to your eardrum. So this is DRP, right? drum yep. positioning for, for measurements. The difference is that these curves will look different. Uh, I think we can show that at some point, maybe later. Um, and the main thing is that with the 711 coupler, the full ear, the measurements are never flat. It's never a flat line because it's actually showing the boost at around 3K, which is due to your uh, ear canal resonances. So everybody has it at different, different positions and that ear is kind of designed um, as a, a good representation of all the ears that are on the planet Earth. So, um, for doing the target curve, we'll be taking the 711 with us, not this one. This one is going to stay in production uh, and we are using it daily for, for quality checks, uh, quality controls and consistency of our headphones. And for doing that, it's magical. Yeah. I really love lights, especially on gear. We need a uh, two-sided um, hmm. cable, double TRS. Oh, the company it. doesn't have a cable. Oh, we can make one. <laughs> um, all right, I found something not ideal. So before we leave tomorrow morning, we have to stop at the studio and we should be ready to do a test run and if everything is fine we can pack the gear have a good night's sleep yeah 10 hours of driving a few hours of working and then wunder schnitzel or what's it called in, in <laughs> vienna wunder <laughs> schnitzel i don't know what's I it know. called boss space mm. Mm. Now, whoever's driving the car pays for the <laughs> tickets. Okay, you're driving back. <laughs> <laughs> for the headphones and for the for the 7-Eleven coupler, that is a representation of SPL, sound pressure level, at your eardrum. And that's a massive difference. That's why it looks the way it looks. And over here, this, this bump is actually uh, your inner, inner uh, ear canal um resonancing right so that's mimicking it that's why it's useful for headphones design so that we can see how things uh work let's pack the gear get some sleep and we start the journey tomorrow all right We have arrived to Vienna, to the Synchron Stage Studios, and over here, behind me, we have the Control Room B, um, certified Dolby Atmos room. I think a few months ago, uh, over here is Bernd. Say hi, Bernd. Hi. Uh, so he's the guy who was with Dolby when they were doing uh, testing and stuff, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. Um, so uh, we'll catch with him and with, uh, with Flo a little bit later. So these guys are going to show us around the synchronous stage uh, in the afternoon. But first, we have Gregor over there and Frank Jr. working on some measurements.
by the time has come to pack our things and get back home. The measurements are done and we are going to explore them in the coming days and come back to you guys with a full report. Hopefully we were successful, but we don't know that yet. We got to get home and test it. But before we go, we are going to get a tour of this beautiful, well, studio. It's, it's kind of amazing, so stick around. <laughs> what, what's this room? Uh, that's stage B. It's a small one, so for rock bands, drum sets, uh, choirs, uh, quartets. <laughs> Real quick, I don't know. Something. This is stage A, where all the, the, the main uh, recordings are happening for, for orchestra. Uh, there is space for around 120 people and normally we are recording uh, film scores in here. The bass frequencies are much shorter in the reverb than the mid frequencies and the high frequencies. Ah. So you don't have any masking effects in here because the low end is, is very impulsive but it's gone very fast. Mm -hmm. So woodwinds and, and, and strings are back very fast again. I didn't want to choose different companies because otherwise they could say, yeah, but you have that one, you have that one. So SSL was my, my, my first choice because of, of transients and, 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 and so on. Uh, and uh, noise to signal ratios and so on. Um, and then I really stayed with the SSL, so we have one uh, complete thing. and. The gain staging is always the same. You don't mm. have different input and output gains. Mm. It's always the same, which is very nice and very important. So here we have an SSL 96. Mm -hmm. A lot of 500 modules to have some different colors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's our main working space. Oh, okay. you have a Bible. Yeah. It's a guest book. It's the guest book. Actually, you should probably... It's our Bible. <laughs> the guest book. You should probably sign that as well. Yeah. You're signing something. <laughs> He's signing his life away. Yeah. Yeah, knock yourself out. <laughs> okay, so we decided to, to take a visit to Synchron Stage in Vienna. Mm -hmm to measure the control B room, actually. Mm. Gregor, you did a lot of research on how to capture mm -hmm. a room, yeah. uh, including the Harman version of it, uh, but we also talked to, uh, to Grass, who are provider of, of uh, the ear simulators for us, um, and we come down to different ways of, of capturing rooms and different ways, ways of averaging the, the responses into something something useful mm -hmm. um, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit on uh, how did you decide to place uh, the ear simulator in the room or what position and then how did you decide to to capture uh, all the speakers since Dolby Atmos is uh, 7.4 yeah. system there yeah. yeah so uh, firstly we placed uh, the microphone uh, on the listening pos position. Uh, they provided uh, all the measurements, uh, the height, the, the length, the everything, like Dolby did. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically then we calibrated every speaker, monitor mm -hmm. actually, uh, on 79 dB SPL. So individual speaker was yeah. at 79 and it was only one speaker playing when we were calibrating yeah. With the microphone. With the microphone, yes. Okay. If we take uh, an average of every speaker, we get really this... Uh, really close to, to, to Dolby yeah, target actually. curve, actually, which, which is great. Um, it means that the room is... Well, we just did a, a second test, basically. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that... I don't know, but uh, I think that one of the benefits of doing uh, a measurements on your own like that is that you have a reference point so now we have our own gear which we know exactly what it is 
Yeah. Uh, and we can retake with the same gear a different studio and we can compare these two, two studios or we can try and recreate a Dolby target curve in our own lab um, and we will have the same tolerances and the same deviations because we are using the same gear as we did mm -hmm. in Vienna, uh, which kind of proves the point of doing that using uh, a microphone before we moved to the, to the ear simulator. So if, if we now look at the the charts, yeah. the results from the, the ear simulator measurements. Um, it looks fairly, fairly different, obviously. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is, has been explained before, uh, the ear simulator will have a different uh, acoustic impedance and will show different things. So for example, over here, uh, it's quite obvious the resonance of your uh, ear canal uh, adds around two to five K uh, where you have this this little bump uh, over there. So that is capturing the room with the ear simulator. Uh, and what we're seeing over here is the, the average of, of all the speakers. All the speakers where uh, the ear simulator was facing forward. Always forward. Always. Uh, and the speakers were individually playing the yeah, signal. Yeah. W what was the signal used? The uh, signal was uh, sweep from 20 to 20k hertz. Mm. Um, um, so Dolby Atmos will include or incorporate uh, subs as well. Uh, and we can see a subwoofer over here. It's, um, it's designed to be double the loudness, which is kind of 10 dB. And that's very close yeah. over here as well. So it's 10 dB louder um, than the other speakers. And it only goes um, up to 200 hertz uh, when it rolls off real, real fast. Um, so in the average, uh, are we calculating the sub as well? Uh, we did for this uh, average, but actually if they told us that uh, the subs are not actually used much. Many times. Yeah. yeah. So here we can see that the, the curve is quite different if we are using the subs or if we are not using the subs in the, in the final uh, result. That is a, a solid research. Um, and um, actually you guys, you can comment uh, as well uh, down below or send us you know, emails or whatever. Um, and we'll try to explore uh, this further with you.